So I want to start with just the, the, the basic question. You've got a wonderful piece by Uncle Roger. There's three works involved in Uncle Roger, right? Party at Woodside, Blue Notebook, and Terminal. Yes. And we're and this Pathfinders project is looking specifically at Blue Notebook. Yes. But it makes no sense to just talk about that today without contextualizing. No, it. I'm, I'm yeah. So we you please sense. start by, you know, talking about the large project of Uncle Roger, and then how these three pieces fit, and then what Blue Notebook means as a separate entity. Okay, um, that's a tall order. Yeah, um, I'll take a few minutes. But uh, um, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> well, just think in terms of the work itself. So, you know, what, what was the kind of the, the impetus to create a work called Uncle Roger, and the way you conceptualized three pieces? I know that serial, serial publication, that kind of stuff. Yes. Just kind of go through that historical piece. Okay. I was um, invited on to our common electronic network in 1986 by an old friend of mine, Carl Leffler, who was a video and performance art curator. And he had, was very closely involved with Canadian artists and Canadian art spaces and had, was, had seen the importance of online communication through working with um, oh, Bill Bartlett, who was involved with art text, and he himself earlier had worked with Willoughby Sharp and Les Beer and um, Sharon Grace on the Send Receive project, which was a, a project that involves sending images back and forth between California and, and New York City, or between New York City and California, depending on which node you are at. And um, Carl had the idea of actually starting a art space online that had interactive communication, but in addition to interactive communication, it also had would have a menu with interactive artworks and they were going to they switched publishing Artcom magazine into uh, an online publication and they also had a store where they were going to sell artist software, which in fact they did. It was actually a very visionary project for 1986. And they chose the well because the, the well's values fit their own values. And so Carl, in the spring of 1986, talked me onto going, <laughs> into going on uh, because I had been working at the time on a project called Bad Information that I was computerizing. And I was, he thought I would be a good fit for the project. He, I had performed in his space before and knew my work. So um, that was the catalyst for Uncle Roger. Now, I had been working with artist books that uh, trying to create an random access narratives and narratives that were non sequential oh, since 1976. And, but I had never, it ne I had never done specifically what I wanted, mainly because all I could do was create a one. So okay, time. this is an example of what I, of an earlier, I think this is a 1981 book I created, that you push buttons and the images came around. The problem was actually it was a great work and um, people liked it, but you could only make one. So I was coming from a little bit the same place Carl was coming from. How can we distribute um, experimental literature? Um, and in this case, computer-mediated experimental literature. Um, so I went on. I, I was amazed. I, I actually took, it took a little talking on his part because I wasn't used to online communications. I had to go out and buy a modem. In those days, it was not that difficult, easy to you know, set up with a modem. It was slow. You had to figure out. You had to have communication software. You had to integrate it with your computer. It was relatively inexpensive because you paid by the minute, relatively expensive rather, you paid by the minute. But I was amazed when I logged on. There was an entire community there. There were people talking to each other on what we would now call social media network. network and I programmed it into a database. Now at that point I went, oh my god, all this work that I've been trying to put together, all these artist books that I've been trying to create a random access work, I can do it on the computer. And there's an audience on, on, on early social media. So there were a lot of factors that went into it. Early social media was certainly a very important part of it because it was as if 
you could go back to, say, Homer's Day and go into the virtual, this is a virtual online community, and tell a story, and you have an audience. So I began writing Uncle Roger in August of 1996. I figured I would create uh, about a hundred what we now call Lexias and would write a database to pull them up and that the reader would ne negotiate the work by essentially searching keywords, which is not too dissimilar from searching links in a work of hypertext. Uh, searching keywords and following paths throughout the work. Sorry, Judy, you just said 96, you meant 86. 86, 86 I'm 86. sorry, 86, thank you. It was 86, um, August of 1986. And uh, so I, I wrote, the, it took me about six months to write the work. I then, um, on December 1st, 86, I put the first Lexia out on the, onto the on Archon Electronic Network. But this is not too dissimilar from writing a narrative on Twitter. You will see people writing narratives on Twitter um, nowadays. Mm -hmm. And you, you, yourself, to, you yourself did yeah, an yeah. entire 24 hour microlit uh, work. Uh, uh, and, but at the time it was a fairly new idea, or a new idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was amazing. <laughs> I loved doing it that way. Mm -hmm. I worked in essentially in the way, you know, or, uh, used to be long ago, the days of Charles Dickens, for instance, a work of literature was written, written that way. Only I, I didn't put out an entire chapter. I put out one or two records or lexias, as they're now called, every day. And pretty quickly, I attracted an audience. Now, I, at that time, I, put up the links or keywords with the with the Lexia. And I said to the readers, you can put this into your own database. Because there were, it was a fairly computer literate audience. And I had wondered when I started writing this, well, are people going to interrupt the story? Will they ask me questions in the middle of the story? How will that work? But about the second day I had posted the work, I began posting the work. Howard Rheingold set up a topic um, about Uncle to respond to Uncle Roger. And I think he began, yeah, what can we say about Uncle Roger as he unfolds? And so there was a parallel topic in the conferencing system where the audience could discuss the work and I could respond to them. And they asked questions ranging from what is this about to how do I put this into my database? Or how would this work in the future? And so it's like a fan site, like for gaming today. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It was very similar to what you will see nowadays, uh, but at the time it was very unusual and very exciting. Also, I mean, I had no idea that I was going to attract such a big audience, but a lot of it, it was very galvanizing on our common electronic network. We brought in people from you know other parts of the well. And they were interested in the story. Somebody told me it was their bedtime story every day. And uh, it was a lot of fun to do. And I also found telling the story that way, every, only putting out one or two paragraphs a day, a lot of editing. I did a lot of editing mm -hmm. from when I first wrote it. So it was pretty carefully crafted. And at the same time, you know, I, I appeal to the social media nature of the, of the audience. Which I think is one reason Uncle Roger is a little different from other kinds of other <coughs> works of electronic literature. I, I partially conceived of it as what was called a jig in Renaissance England. Uh, it was a body piece of, of short theater that would pull the audience in. And I, I was writing to the audience, which is another reason Uncle Roger is different. I also was telling a story that was relevant to the audience. The story. The background of Uncle Roger is the chip industry, which was the start of the personal computer industry, a, a lesser known chapter nowadays. But at that time, if you lived in California the way you d I did, and you had lived in the valley, and your audience were partially people who you know were from the valley or were, from, were in programmers or were familiar with the history, they knew what the story was about. 
I think nowadays I could explain that a little better. Because the story, a basis for the story is, is chip espionage. You know, the, the, the important thing was to create the fastest chip. Mm -hmm. It was very core in creating Apple II. Intel created the 8000A chip and then the 8080 chip. And this, it, it allowed for um, microprocessors that, that were fast enough and sophisticated enough to run a personal computer of this size. Yep. And so the story of Uncle Roger essentially revolves around this the chip industry in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, some the, the kinds of parties that, that took place in Silicon Valley at the time, the people who were involved, uh, the places that were involved, uh, the, the sort of the spirit of the chip industry. Uh, and so I also felt that that worked for, for the audience and it was something that was a story that was important to tell. I had been married to a, 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 a semiconductor engineer, so I was not unfamiliar with the parties or with, what, with, with, with the industry. And at the same time, I finished up, I had a female narrator, which was somewhat unusual for computer literature at that time, or interactive fiction, which is what computer literature was at that time. Mm. I had a female, the narrator was a, was a woman, uh, the work is somewhat um, loosely across from a, from a Renaissance era theatrical jig and Jane Austen. And I like the work myself. It's, I, it's, it has a certain clarity, it, it reaches back to the era, and I concluded it, I felt on the third file, Terminals, I concluded it with a word processing st station, where the narrator moves out of sh sh in the in the beginning, uh, taking the Jane Eyre model. I made her a babysitter for a, a magnet in a, a, you know mm -hmm. a, a head of a lot of semiconductor industry companies. He had four companies, N not unusual in that area. Mm -hmm. Houses all over the country, four companies, a lot of money, people moving in and out, problems mm -hmm. with the chips, stealing other people's designs. Uh, but in the last, in the last file, uh, the, the narrator moves out on her own into a, uh, a very female word processing center in the early days. And she describes the computers that they use, she, the thoughts that go through her head are mingled, the feeling of being in this early word processing shop. and. And her own life. Interesting question: Are you were you trying to parallel? You know, the early the term computer comes from the wo women who handled the computers during World War II, right in England. Yes. They were called computers, and the women who came to the fifties were called. I didn't computers. know that at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it wasn't a parallel. Uh, essentially, uh, it was more a real life. Yeah. You know, a okay. real life situation for the era. Yeah. And I also felt in the first two files the men. Were, were very dominant. And I wanted to, to shift the focus, so I shifted the narrator's setting to the word processing. And that was terminal. That's terminals, yeah. Uh, although the, the chip espionage story runs through that.